Hello and welcome to another of my Show Me tutorials. In this one we're talking about cortical topography and to help explain this I'm going to draw a diagram that I frequently draw in one of my lectures and it is a representation of the two cerebral hemispheres. So we've got a left and a right. We can join them together with the corpus callosum there and we can add on this groove that runs down the midline which is known as the longitudinal fissure. Now, when you look at a brain for yourself inside the lab, you're going to look at its wrinkled surface and you're probably going to think, how on earth am I going to begin to understand patterns of arrangement here anatomically? And it is quite difficult, but hopefully this tutorial will enable you to build some confidence with trying to identify some key landmarks. I think once you get started, it does become much easier. But before we do that, let's actually just think about what we're dealing with. So we've got this cortex covering the two hemispheres and the term cortex means bark or rind and it's lamina and columnar in, in structure and it's made up of a bunch of uh, folds known as gyri and also some intervening grooves known, known as sulci and like I said these gyri and sulci may appear random but there's there's some some good um, reliable patterns that we can identify in all human brains. What I want you to do is I want you to imagine that you're in a lab holding a human brain in your hands and you are looking at this particular view and I want your eyes to start at the front which is anterior up here and posterior back here so I want your eyes to start up here at the anterior end and I want them to journey back roughly midway so roughly to about this region in here and I want you to look for two strips of cortex that look similar in shape and size and tend to mimic each other's folds. And once you've found those, you will see a groove that runs between them. And by identifying that groove, you've identified what's known as the central sulcus. Now I think ident identifying the central sulcus is really key and you should always do it first when looking at this view because essentially what it helps you do is identify the frontal lobe which is everything anteriorly and everything posterior from there is the parietal lobe. Now if you keep going posteriorly you will end up in the occipital lobe and the occipital lobe is at the back of the brain back here but unfortunately you won't be able to see where the parietal lobe ends and the occipital lobe begins from this particular view. You have to look at a different view in order to see the sulcus that separates them. Let's go back to our central sulcus in here let's go back to those two strips of cortex that hopefully you've identified. Let's draw them on. One is going to be in the frontal lobe and the other one is going to be in the parietal lobe. So let's draw them on and let's name them. The one in the frontal lobe is known as the primary motor cortex. The one in the parietal lobe is known as the primary sensory cortex. So one has a motor function, the other a sensory function. These have anatomical names as well. The primary motor cortex can also be called the pre-central gyrus, or the primary sensory cortex is often referred to as the post-central gyrus. Now these areas that I've identified are called primary areas. And these primary areas are what's known as somatotopically arranged. This basically means is that they form a cortical map of the human body. Another way to describe it that's often referred to in textbooks is it's a, a cortical map of the human body that's resembled as an upside down half humunculus. So this strip of cortex, both the primary motor and primary sensory cortex, represents the opposite side of the body. So voluntary motor control from the right side is controlling the left musculature, while incoming sensory information from the left is traveling and being processed by the right-sided primary sensory cortex. It's also upside down which means the cortical representation of the human body or at least one half of the human body is, uh, is completely reversed so the head would be located somewhere in here while the feet and toes would be on the medial surface somewhere in here. So just remember that it's, uh, it's an upside down representation and the cortical map in these primary areas is uh, representing the opposite side of the body. So, primary motor cortex is where all voluntary motor control comes from. 
and the primary sensory cortex is where all general sensory information is processed. But these primary areas can't do their job on their own. They need support from what we call association areas. And these association areas perf perform a supporting role to the primary areas. And we'll start by talking about the area here in the frontal lobe, which can be generally referred to as the association motor cortex. So the association motor cortex, very generally speaking, is there to put together a sequence of neurons that will fire in a particular pattern that will enable the primary motor cortex to provide smooth, fluid, voluntary movements. Without it, we would get jerky, uncoordinated movements. It can be subdivided into two specific areas. One, which is actually located where the asterisk is here on the superior surface, which is called the pre-motor area. And I'll just abbreviate that to MA. It's a pre-motor area. There's also an area that just sits in here, just folding over onto the medial surface in here. And that's called the supplementary motor area. Now they perform slightly different supporting roles. The premotor area is involved in any or the planning of any motor control which involves eyesight, which involves vision. So any visually guided voluntary motor uh, movement would involve activity first of all by the premotor area and then neurons would then stimulate the primary motor cortex in order to carry out voluntary uh, voluntary behavior. The supplementary motor area is much more involved with internal cues. So any thought directed or drive directed movement that we think about that we want to carry out would be generated by the supplementary motor area first and then uh, those neurons would uh, communicate with the primary motor cortex in order to carry out that voluntary function. So. The association motor cortex is made up of the pre-motor area and the supplementary motor area. Let's now journey into the parietal lobe and let's map on the association area which is supporting the primary sensory cortex. And this is just called the sensory association area. And the sensory association area is there to enable previous experience and any information about or sensory information that we've previously learned to inform the processing of incoming sensory signals. So it allows us to use experience to put any incoming sensory signals into context. It also allows the strength of incoming sensory signals to be altered in some way and, and, and what it supports the primary sensory cortex in doing is enabling the primary sensory cortex to only process the most important sensory information that's coming in. So we may at any one time have a number of sensory signals coming in and we may want to prioritise those. So for example, we would prioritise pain signals over may, maybe general tactile information coming from our clothes, for example. So the sensory association area is an area that sits in the parietal lobe and is much less well defined than the primary sensory cortex. In fact, it's worth saying that the association areas in general are about six times larger than the primary areas and, and also uh, less well defined. So you won't be able to look for particular uh, sulci that, uh, that marks their borders. Unfortunately, that's not the case, and nor will you be expected to. But you'd just be expected to know roughly where these areas reside. I briefly now want to talk about the, the clinical names for conditions when we get lesions to these particular brain areas. So first of all, if we get a problem with the primary motor cortex in here, we are going to have some form of paralysis. If we have a problem with the primary sensory cortex, we are going to have sensory deficits and some form of anaesthesia. If we have a problem in here in the association motor cortex, it means that we're going to have something known as apraxia because without the planning activity of the association motor cortex, both the pre 
motor area and the supplementary motor area. We can't have smooth flowing mo movements. This isn't paralysis. Apraxia is um, not being able to voluntary, voluntarily initiate motor control without there being any problems with the neurons that innervate the muscles. That's apraxia. If we come back to the sensory association area, if we have a problem or a lesion there, then often patients will suffer with something that's known as agnosia, which means not to know. And uh, that means that we may lose contextual information about incoming sensory signals. So it may be that um, remembering uh, what particular objects feel like or what their names are and what they're for may, may not um, be available um, to us to call up even though there isn't any problem with actually um, interpreting the sensory signal. So the localization of touch is okay, but actually knowing what this particular object is just by touch or knowing what it's for, that may be lost, and that's called agnosia. Okay, hopefully that will help you get started when looking at a brain for yourself. I shall see you very soon. Subscribe to Sultan Brain Hub for more videos to help explain the mysteries of the brain.